Today's video comes at the request of a subscriber. He reached out and asked if I'd be willing to take a look at this. This is the Aurelic Up to Stream uh, DIY Amp. So we're going to take a look today at what we can do with this locally without the need for an app and how we might be able to use it in Home Assistant. So hang around. Hi and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. As I mentioned, this video is at the request of one of my subscribers who goes by Expel Serviceman. I've come to know him as Rich, but he reached out and asked if I would be willing to take a look at one of these Aurelic uh, DIY amp boards. He uses a couple of them in his house and wanted to know what kind of additional features or things we might be able to do with it locally or within Home Assistant. So Aurelic did not send me this board. In fact, Rich sent me this board. So this video is sponsored by Rich. Thank you very much, Rich, for sending this to me. Now, Rich had shared with me with a couple of amps that he owns that the onboarding and use process of this amp is very easy and intuitive through the mobile app. So what I wanted to do, though, was take a look at how far could I get and what could I do by never installing that mobile app. So this isn't going to be the normal uh, review video of using this thing with their mobile app. Instead, we're really going to take a DIY approach, see how far we can get, with never installing the mobile app, and what other kind of advanced features might be available for building your own custom projects. This is also not going to be a review of the audio output quality of the amp. First of all, I don't have a good way to measure things like frequency responses, and to be honest, anything that comes through video isn't going to sound as good as it does live. Second, I just really can't use any real music to show off the amp. Uh, if I were to attempt to use any kind of real music, it would probably result in a copyright strike. Now, there are other videos out there that do talk about the audio output quality of this amp. So if that's what you're interested in, you might check those out. And because there is so much to cover here, it's going to be a rather lengthy video. So be sure to use those chapter links down in the video description or along the timeline here at the bottom if you want to jump ahead to a particular part. And as always, there'll be links to all the products that I used down in the video description. With that, let's take a little closer look at the amp itself. So this is the Aurelic Up to Stream Amp 2.0. Uh, it says it's powered by 12 to 24 volt uh, DC. And I've not opened this yet, so let's pop this open and take a look at it. Uh, we have a very basic little card here with not a lot of information on it. Here to that. So we have a speaker attachment, and this is the board itself. Okay, we do have at least a... A little bit more of a user manual down here. Interesting enough, it says AMP uh, V4 on here. But this says AMP 2.0. And we got a little screwdriver. So uh, we'll come back to that. Let's uh, see if we can get this thing open. Pull this out. And looks like we got a couple two stickers on here. What I'm guessing is probably Bluetooth and Wi-Fi antennas. And take a look at the back here. Now this does say Upstream Amp V4 board. So this must be referring to the board. So I'm not quite sure what the 2.0 on the lid means. Uh, we're going to go with the fact that the board is labeled this way. So we're going to treat it like a v, uh, V4 board at this point. So there is at least something worth mentioning here. Uh, if you look closely, this was received uh, like this. And it appears that this power button has been broken and this is actually the second one I've received uh, in the same way uh, the first one had the same exact issue sent it back for return and replacement and this second one came in the same exact way so the, the button uh, that you're going to use here to uh, set modes to set it up on Wi-Fi does appear to be broken so I don't know whether that's a result of of when it gets you know placed into the anti-static bag it did look like it was kind of crammed up against there and whether that's getting broken off of there or not but uh, I think I can easily fix this by removing this and just placing a momentary contact uh, button uh, normally open button uh, along here but it is worth noting that I received two in a row of these with this power button broken so just as I got ready to uh, desolder this and, and take it off I did find this inside of the anti-static bag and it's kind of making me wonder if this doesn't fit right down in here and the pushing of that button is what makes momentary contact with this switch. So before I desolder this, I'm just going to see if there's a way that I can put this back in there 
and see if that might possibly repair the issue with this button. But it does seem like a pretty fragile design uh, if that is the case. Okay, I think we may have had some success. By taking that little disc and putting it back in here, and apparently what happened is this piece right here, this plastic piece, probably this button got pushed on and it pushed that back, which allowed that little metal disc to fall out and the button to wobble. So by putting that back in and bringing this up back flush up against the, the metal housing, what I now have is the button isn't near as wiggly, and I don't know whether you can hear that, but I'm now getting a distinct click sound. Uh, so we'll hook up the power to this, but I believe that's what the problem is. So I do think that, again, it's probably because of packaging that this gets shoved back, which bends this little plastic back, which allows that little uh, contact disc to fall out. So I think it's, it is repaired at this point. We're going to hook up the power and we'll find out. So I did want to confirm here that this button is now working. You can see when I push the button, I'm getting different modes uh, here on the LED. That apparently was the problem, and the button is fixed, so now we're ready to move on. So with our power button repaired, let's move on to taking in a quick overview of some of the ports and interfaces on the device. Now there's a lot to look at here. And of course, the main purpose of this thing is to play audio. So of course, we have a lot of inputs and outputs for our speakers. We are going to hook it up, make sure we can can play music, but from a DIY perspective, I'm interested to see what else we might be able to do with this board, and there are a few interesting things here. One of the most interesting is this, uh, what they label as number 18, the pin header. In that, you can see we've got I squared C, IR, uh, analog digital key, not quite sure what that means, LED, does that mean we can control the onboard LED, a reset, then an RX TX ground, and 3.3 volts. So a lot of interesting possibilities there. In addition, the little uh, number 12 header here has two GPIOs, GPIO 1 and 2, and again, a ground and 3.3 volts. And then there's also a through hole on here that labels a ground, a B0, B1, and just GPIO with no number after it. So interested to see what we can do there. We obviously have an IR receiver. They do sell a remote, but we don't want to buy the remote. We might be able to see what we can do with our own IR codes to be able to control this as well. And then finally, there was something that got me kind of excited. The fact that they showed a connection for two mics. So mic one, mic two, and ground. Now, one of the reasons this was exciting for me is if you're a home assistant user, we know that they said in their state of the open home that uh, 2023 was supposed to be the year of voice. And so they're working on having local voice interaction with home assistant. So by having the ability to add a mic here, we might actually be able to turn this into a device where we could interact with our home assistant devices via voice. When I mentioned this to Rich, he said he had talked to the folks from Aurelic and they said that these mics currently are not enabled. And when I looked a little bit closer at my board, these are where they were shown for the two microphones, but on my board, this is now labeled as Phono N. So whether we are going to get microphone support for this or not remains to be seen, but it looks like at least in this version, uh, we aren't going to have the ability to hook up an external mic. Now, if I would just follow my own advice that I give to others and finished reading the you know what manual, a little bit further down, it kind of gives a description of a lot of these pins and their potential uses, including right here at the top where it says mic one and mic two are currently reserved for future use. Uh, we come down here and look a little bit more at a few other things. It does talk about uh, a couple of the GPIO pins down here. Use to connect a coding key. I did see that in some of the API documentation, so we might circle back to that. But here with the I squared C that I was kind of excited about, it says it's reserved for a display panel. Now they sell a display panel. This happens to be an OLED uh, SSD 1306. I've ordered one of those, so I'm going to see if I can hook up my own display to that. The ADC key, again, is to hook up a series of buttons, so I will go ahead and build something similar to that so we can hook up buttons to see if we can uh, use those to control. It looks like I can extend the LED uh, to a separate common anode LED, so I've got some of those on order as well. Uh, the interesting thing is there is 5 volt out to power another device, so it seems to me like I might be able to hook up an ESP8266 or an ESP32 to this and possibly even use RX and TX of the serial interface to possibly uh, interact with this. So that'll take a little bit more digging on, on some documentation to find. 
but a lot of those pins are described down here. So again, if I would just finished reading the manual, uh, I would have known a lot more about these pins. So while there are a lot of DIY possibilities here, obviously the primary purpose of this is to play or stream music. So let's take a, a quick look at some of the specifications. Obviously we have Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Bluetooth, and we have USB ports. We're going to test all those different ways to make sure that we can play music. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is a 12 to 24 volt DC. And we can take a look at some of the power ratings based on supported uh, speaker impedance of 4 to 8 ohms down here. We're going to look at the DIY stuff, but first I want to uh, hook some of this up and just make sure that we can play music via Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and USB. So a couple other items I'll be using for my testing. I am going to use a 24 volt 6 amp power supply, uh, a Relic Cells one that comes with this, and it's a 24 volt 4.1 amp. So I'm going to assume that 6 amps ought to be more than enough, at least to put it through its paces. So for the speakers, I'm going to try a couple of different pairs. These are some old speakers that I had sitting around in closets. But the bottom set here, the larger pair, are EPI Magnus A10s. They are 4 ohm speakers rated for up to 100 watts. And the smaller ones on the top are Polk Audio T15 bookshelf speakers. And those are 8 ohm speakers rated at up to 75 watts per channel. But before we can try any of these features, the first thing we have to do is we have to get this device onboarded onto our local network. And of course, like most of these devices, the first thing I want you to do is go out and download an app on your mobile device. You know, it does look like it has some, some interesting features on there. But again, since those of us or a lot of us use Home Assistant, we're all about local control. I want to see just how far I can get with this device without using the app or even installing it. We've got an Ethernet port, and according to the API documentation, I ought to be able to use the API to onboard it onto Wi-Fi with never downloading and installing the app. So to see if we can onboard this thing without uh, using the app, we're going to start out with just an Ethernet connection here. I click the button and see if we can find it somewhere on our network at this point. And sure enough, when I pull up my router settings, I see it being listed as sound system uh, B6AE. Not sure where the B6AE comes from. It's not the last four of the MAC address, but I've got an IP address. Let's just try putting this IP address in a browser and see what comes up. All right, here in the browser, just by putting in the IP address, we see we've reached an, a web interface. And it looks like I'm actually able to select different sources. Now, Wi-Fi would be interesting because I haven't onboarded it onto my Wi-Fi yet. But it looks like I can do Bluetooth through the, the input or through USB under the settings. Now, right now, it's, it's prompting me for a web management password, which I have not set up anywhere. Okay, well, the default password was just admin, so that was easy enough to get into. So again, it looks like I can uh, assign a, a static IP address here, set a new password. Uh, it does look like it gives me the ability to update the firmware if there's a version out there. We do have, it looks like, the option to create radio uh, stations or URLs. But we have that option. And input source. Again, it looks like a uh, playlist or a preset list, which may have to be set up through the app. So we do have some basic controls here. I don't have any speakers hooked up yet. But I'm going to see if I can use that API to put this onto my Wi-Fi. So this is the HTTP API document. Now it says confidential no disclosure on here, but considering the fact it's available for download off the Aurelic site, I'm going to guess it's okay to show here. Now one thing uh, I do want to note that this was last revised in 2016. No guarantee that, that the API is still going to work or is still the same, but that's the most recent I could find. So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to issue this get device information command to see if I get anything returned on here, and that will at least let us know the API is working. Okay, I am getting a return here, and so it is a, a JSON list of things, but it's gonna give me in here, just kind of look through here, there's my port, the MAC address, looking for the IP address, there it is, 213 off of that. So I should be able to also check my Wi-Fi after I issue that command and be sure that it's working. And here's the HTTP command to connect to the Wi-Fi. Now notice that it does say that the SSID and the password have to be passed in hex. So I'm going to go ahead and, and get the hex values for that. Obviously, I'm not going to show it here on the screen. Issue that command. Now, it says it doesn't return anything. But once it's done, I can issue this command to 
check the connected state and hopefully we'll come back and see an OK. And at that point, I should also see a new IP address in my router. Well, I'm happy to report that it took a few tries, but I am now getting an OK back connected on the Wi-Fi. And if I go over to my router, I will now see I have a new IP address, which is now going to be my Wi-Fi connection. Now, the reason it took a few tries here was to try to get the formatting exactly right for that command, but I was able to use this command here. And what that's going to do is actually scan for all my Wi-Fi networks. And so here happens to be the SSID that I'm using, and it was able to give me the authorization and the encryption things that it was looking for for that particular network. So the good news is we do have this now joined to Wi-Fi. I can tell you if we take a quick look over here at the device, uh, I now have a, a little hard to see the color, but a solid green light instead of a flashing green light, which is the uh, Wi-Fi connection. So now we're going to disconnect the Ethernet, uh, make sure we can still get to the web interface, and we now have this thing boarded on Wi-Fi without use of the app. So I did want to quickly show this. I am able to get to the web interface with the Wi-Fi IP address, but notice it's just sitting here and spinning as loading. I don't know if it, the reason it's doing that is it's looking for a connection to that, that mobile app on your phone. It just continues to load. Obviously, it's on the Wi-Fi because I was able to reach this web interface, but the fact that it's just sitting there spinning as loading, at least we were able to reach the web interface over Wi-Fi. So try as I might, I tried different machines and I tried different browsers. I could not get that built-in web app to respond when the device was on Wi-Fi. But that's okay, because what we're really going to do is we want to take a look at the API and see what we can control with various music sources. Now, according to the document here, it looks like we ought to have the ability to do just about anything that we could do through either the mobile app or the built-in web app. Let me add here, if you are going to go down this DIY route and try to use the API and not use the app, be prepared to do a little bit of research. The documentation, or at least the official documentation, is pretty sketchy. You get this two-sided sheet that comes with it, and there is a single API docu document available on the Aurelic site. It leaves a little bit to be desired. You're probably going to be spending a lot of time Googling and looking in forums for some of the information you might need. So to test out the API, what I've done is I've went ahead and hooked the amp up to these 8-ohm bookshelf speakers. And you can see by the little uh, light indicator here, it's, it's supposed to be white. To me, it looks like a pale green. But that basically lets me know that it's available on the Wi-Fi. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my phone to try streaming via Bluetooth. I'm going to use a standard USB to micro USB cable to hook up directly to a PC into the micro USB port. And I'm also going to try a thumb drive hooked into the standard USB port, all to see if we can play music from all of those sources and what kind of control we have through the API. And of course, the one test that isn't represented here that's probably one of the biggest ones for me personally is, am I able to take the music that I have on my Synology NAS and stream that over Wi-Fi to these speakers and this device? The device is supposed to be a DLNA uh, media player. It also supports AirPlay. So that will be the biggest test that really isn't represented here. So I did end up testing all of those different sources. And like I said, I, I'm not going to play back the music here, but I will say that the audio quality seemed very good to me. Uh, plenty of volume. The speakers were plenty loud, so there was no issue there. But when streaming via Bluetooth with my phone, Obviously, I was able to stream pretty much any service uh, that was available on my phone, whether that be Amazon Music or YouTube Music or Sirius XM, just like you would with any other Bluetooth speaker. As far as API control, I could mute and I could increase and decrease the volume. Obviously, I couldn't skip to the next track or you know, back to the previous track, but that would be expected with you know, streaming an online service. When it comes to the hookup with PC, basically the PC saw it as an additional set of speakers. So really anything you could do with speakers that you hooked into your PC, you would be able to do here. From an API control, again, I could mute, increase and decrease volume, could not control the tracks. At least I couldn't figure out a way with the API. Now the USB thumb drive was a totally different matter. With that, I pretty much had full control. Uh, do note that I had to step down to an 8 gig uh, USB drive. Apparently, the amplifier has problems with any uh, USB device larger than that. But once I had the music playing, I could pause, mute, control volume, skip forward, skip backwards, move to the next track, pretty much full control.
So while full control of some sources aren't available through the API, the good news is the API will always return a bunch of information about the state of the amp and what's playing. In this particular case, it actually is from the USB drive, and it's returning all of the songs that are available on that USB. Unfortunately, all these values are hexed, which means they have to be converted back to plain text. So this does bring up another point. While that API control is great, who's going to want to type all these commands into a browser every time you want to change something on the AMP? Well, that's where some of these other inputs or available options on the AMP come into play. But before we get to that, what about that DLNA uh, being able to stream from my Synology device? Well, here's the great news. Home Assistant automatically discovered this device as soon as it joined my network. Now, the first times when I did that with Ethernet, I opted to ignore that one because I really wanted to use this with Wi-Fi. But once I did get it onboarded with Wi-Fi, Home Assistant again popped up with a notification that the device was discovered. A very simple uh, click the configure button, added it to Home Assistant. I now have a DNLA media player in Home Assistant. So just by going over to the default media sources in Home Assistant, I can go into my uh, Synology, which is actually my DLNA server. And if we look down here in the bottom corner, I'll get my head out of the way. Again, you can see this is now available as an output speaker. So now it gives me the ability to play any of the music off my Synology uh, directly to this amp. And since this is just considered a media player by Home Assistant, it also gives me the option to use this like I would any other speaker, which means I can use it in automations to output uh, notifications to the speaker. Testing the new amplifier. And if we look over at audio station within the Synology itself, we can also see that the amplifier is available under two different protocols, DLNA or AirPlay, for streaming music from your Synology directly to the amp. So up until this point, we've been able to do an awful lot with never installing that mobile app on our phone. But as I mentioned, issuing HTTP commands via a browser to be able to control the amp is not going to be very convenient. But the fact that we have it integrated into Home Assistant already gives us a lot of possibilities. Through either automations or other controls, you can issue HTTP commands through something like a shell command, or even through ESP Home, where you can issue HTTP GET and POST commands. And there might be still yet other options that you might consider for your own project. To think about some of those, let's go back and take a look at some of those pins and ports we saw at the very beginning of this video. So if you remember way back at the start of this video, I talked about this particular pin header that has a lot of features and options. Amongst those is I squared C, which can be used to hook up a local display. So I'm going to try that. In addition, there's an ADC key, which means I can hook up a series of buttons to try to offer some local control. Now, there are a couple of issues right off the get go of trying to breadboard something like this, which is what I want to do. First is the fact that these pins only have two millimeter spacing, which means they're too close together to use uh, DuPont connectors and since uh, a Rulik doesn't sell a cable or a pin header, and this is 13 pins, it's a little hard to find something. First thing I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to build my own little pin headers here uh, to use for this. But I'm going to breadboard. I'm going to try the display first, and then we will try the buttons. Okay, I've hooked the board up. Uh, unfortunately, I'm unable to get anything to display on the board, and I've tried uh, both 3.3 and 5 volts to power the board, and I've also tried uh, different audio sources and I can't get anything at all on the display here. After doing a little bit more research, come to find out that the output to a display is only through the DAC or the DAC, and Relic does sell their own display board. It looks like there's an extra processor in there. Now, some people did report success in using something like an ESP32 and the serial or UART communication to take the data and then format it and display uh, onto an external display like this. But it doesn't appear that you can use your own display at least directly with this board without something like an ESP32 in between. So here's where I've mocked up some buttons. Now note that it supports up to 11 buttons. I've just selected five, a mode button, a play pause, volume up, volume down, and mute. And I have much better luck here, although it took some finagling because once again, the documentation wasn't really correct. Um, everything is functioning great. See here, I'm able to change modes through this. Uh, I can confirm that the uh, play pause button works on multiple sources. So it works over Bluetooth. It does work with DLNA. 
Now my mute button, I didn't actually have a 12K resistor, so I actually put a, I believe a 10K and a 2.2 in series here, and I push that, it actually powers the board off. So again, I think that's just a result of not having the exact resistance there. And there are a lot more buttons that you could add for this. So the good news is that the buttons work, and they work with more sources than what I was able to get working with the API. Connected so it should to be your Wi-Fi network. It should be very easy to get these things uh, into a, a small case with this and Connected have local button Wi-Fi control. Network. And finally, I did just want to show uh, extending the uh, LED again using these pin headers, so I can extend this out. If you're going to put this in some kind of case or something. As I switch modes here, you'll see that it's going to switch. So, you know, green is our line in. Uh, this pink color is USB. White is Wi-Fi. And again, the blue is back to Bluetooth. So, again, just wanted to show using those three uh, RGB pins here on this, we can extend our LED indicator. So there are a lot of other possibilities. I just simply don't have time to go into in this particular video. I think one of the most interesting to explore would be potentially adding something like an ESP32 and using the serial port uh, to communicate. That would, for one, allow us probably to add some kind of uh, display. And you could also do other things like maybe adding sensors or who knows, and you could run ESP Home or a custom Arduino code onto here and extend the use of this board even more. I also didn't take a look at the uh, IR receiver. I did just try a, a vanilla generic remote. It didn't respond. They do make all the IR codes available and there is an IR pin on this header as well. So something using something like an ESP32 and your own IR receiver, you might be able to do something there as well. So again, there's so much more you can do with this amp, and I really just focused on what you can do locally without any kind of external systems. Never really touched on things you can do with Home Assistant. I did show that since Home Assistant automatically discovers and integrates it, you can do all sorts of automations with that and treat it just like any other normal media players. You can also use multiple amps, sync them together to do whole home audio. We never took a look at that. Now I'm even trying to decide myself what I eventually want to do with this amp. So if you've used one of these yourself, uh, let me know down in the comments how you used it, or if you'd like to see me do a follow-up video with maybe something around Home Assistant or integrating uh, an ESP32, let me know that down in the comments as well, and I can definitely consider doing a follow-up video. If you found anything in this video that you liked or found helpful, do me a favor and hit that like button. Click that subscribe button if you'd like to see more of my videos and ding that little bell icon when you want to be notified when I release new content. As always, I'd like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.